Hello YouTube, it's Carrie here and welcome back to Carrie's Bariatric Gardening. I hope everybody's doing great. Today we've got a doozy. We're going to be covering <laughs> Seed Starting 101. So there is a lot to cover today. Um, I'm going to put some timestamps down below. I'm going to be using some notes today because we have a lot of stuff to go over. Um, this is going to be an all around encompassing of the basics that you really, really need to get down in order to be successful at starting your own seeds at home indoors. Why start seeds indoor? Normally people go to the store, they buy a start, they take it home, they put it in the garden. All is good, they got tomatoes. Well, when you open up that world to the world of seeds, you get to experience a great diversity of different types of vegetables that you wouldn't normally get at the nursery. As you may have heard before on this channel, I am a big fan of Baker Creek. This is their catalog. This is really the reason I went hard on starting seeds from the very first year I started gardening. <laughs> because I got uh, a look at their online catalog. Like, I mean like, you know, I grow those. Look familiar? <laughs> so there's a great diversity of what you can grow when you actually start stuff from seed. Your fail-safe method to getting the really cool varieties that you want in your garden is to start them from seed. So for me, that's the number one driver. Now, a lot of people when they expand their gardening and they're really getting into growing a lot of their own food, they're looking also at the cost of the seedlings. So if you're planting, you know, tomatoes to keep you in sauce for the year, you're, you know, and you're looking at, let's say, let's say you're looking at 30 plants, like, you know, to buy them from a nursery is going to be very expensive, whereas you can buy a pack of tomato seeds and like, it's going to be sort of 30 seeds in there and then you're set. So that's like $3 versus, you know, like $5 a plant for 30 plants. You know, the math is easy. <laughs> so. For two different reasons, like, you know, it's, it's nice to start your own seeds. What are you going to need? So somebody looks at this and they're like, it can look a little bit intimidating, but really all that I have here is a shop light. Um, I know that TSC has got um, shop lights on sale for like 40 bucks right now, I think. And that is a very good deal. Um, it doesn't really take up that much room. If you've got a shelf, you mount the light, like, you know, you can do that in any apartment. That's how I started out. You can also do it if you have a good window, you could do it in the window, but you got to make sure that window gets a lot of light when it comes to the seedlings. Like it's got to get like full sun for most of the day, that window. You're going to need containers. Uh, what kind of containers? So. I see a lot of people using these peat pots and for beginners, I would not actually recommend them. I would not recommend even the, um, the little peat net pots that you can get. And it's funny because I used both of those things the first year, <laughs> the first two years, I think actually, but I found, I, I don't know. I didn't like the way that the roots grew. Like after you grow up for a season and then you look at the root structure, when you pull the plant up, you know, you can sort of see how the root growth uh, was affected by what you grew in. And I wasn't so fond of that. So if you are growing in peat pots, I would recommend that you break the pot up a little bit before you plant it in. Don't just plop it in the ground. Soil, what kind? So there's different kinds of soil. Um, I'm gonna be going over different soils a little bit after, but when it comes to seed starting, you need like sterile seed starting mix. Uh, you don't want to be like raising your seedlings really in garden soil. Um, that being said, there are a few products on the market that are sort of like all-in-one type products. Uh, and these are by brands like, you know, like miracle Girl and that kind of thing. Seeds. Uh, one thing that you want to consider about seeds is like what is appropriate for where you live. It's very often recommended when you start out to look for local seed companies that are growing stuff year over year in the same climate that you live in. So there are climatized seeds. When I order from this company, they're coming from who knows where, they're centralized in Missouri, but like, you know, like they could be grown anywhere. And 
it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the same climate that I'm growing them in. So uh, if I grow them here and the best ones, I save the seed from that and I grow that year over year, then I'm acclimatizing that. Understand a little bit? So you want seeds that perform well in your area, so that's a way to sort of get that. To go to local seed banks, so that's a resource that you can lean on for that. Another thing that you are going to need that a lot of people miss out on is airflow. Now I have the fan turned off right now because I'm filming a video and I didn't want all the noise. But that fan runs 24 seven because in this room, I want a lot of plants and I need airflow. Otherwise I will have mold, I'll have fungus issues, I will get disease on my plants, you know, and then the bugs move in and like it's really not good. So like make sure you have airflow. Now if you're doing a small area, you can just get a clip fan from like the dollar store. That works in the right environment to thrive will get you a, a seedling that is much more likely that, to produce and be healthy during the life of the plant. Okay, we're on to the next section. This is, I mean, like this is a big video, guys. Seed selection. So, ease of growing. Now, I talked about this a little bit in my video about what are my top five <laughs> bariatric crops to grow in your first garden. And ease of growing was part of that decision. So, uh, things that are really tricky to grow, like I would love to grow bleached endive, but it's a, it would be a nightmare. <laughs> you know, my climate is not made for it. Um, the blanching process, like the way that you make it white is very complicated. Like it's, it's just not appropriate for what I'm doing in my home garden. And so even though that's an expensive item, I would love to grow at home. It's just not something I'm willing to dedicate my time to really trying to do right. You want good production out of your garden I and mean, you want a lot of diversity out of your garden, which I think for our diets really should be the goal. Then, you know, certain crops that are a little bit trickier to grow, those might be better to leave for the grocery store. And I think that understanding that sort of balance between like what you can do and what you'd like to do and you know, your, your resources, because you are the resources, you're putting yourself into your garden. So think really about the types of crops that you're selecting. Cost of produce, that's another one that I talk about a lot. Uh, because you know, like, yeah, orange carrots, right? I, I, I do have some orange carrots that I grow. Uh, but like, do I spend a lot of time growing orange carrots? No, I don't because at the store they're really, really cheap and they're trickier to grow and they take a long time. So is it really worth it for me to grow those kind? Unless it's a special kind. So I grow like stuff like Oxheart or Paris Yen, but I don't really grow a lot of like standard carroty looking carrots. I like to grow purple carrots and like the interesting cool looking carrots are like that will be worth the space and time in my garden you know maybe it's got some cool uh anthocyanin so i've got some nutrient density that i don't get from another product so like that's the reason to grow something like that think about that so like for me i'm not putting any time into growing broccoli because as much as i'm sure broccoli that i grow at home will be delicious Broccoli is cheap at the store. I can get broccoli typically for under $2 a head. If that's consistently that price, I'm gonna leave that for the store because uh, in my home garden, I have to think about, yes, it's a little bit tricky. The times I've tried to grow it, I've only gotten leaves. You know, the bugs like to go after it a lot. It takes up a lot of room. All of these things are part of that decision of what I'm gonna actually prioritize to put in that garden. And to start from seed because, you know, this is some dedication when you start doing this. I, I would tell people start small, start small. Start with like a few things, still maybe buy some starts from the garden center, start with a few things. Don't swallow the whole elephant at once, right? <laughs> Your environment, so I discussed this a little before. If you live somewhere that's really, really dry, do you wanna be growing something that likes to grow in a lot of humidity? Probably not, it probably won't thrive. Uh, and the opposite is true. So take these things into consideration and learn a little bit of, about the plant. Like get yourself a garden book. I've been using this, look at this garden planner. I've been using this since the first year I started gardening. And it's a little treasure trove of information for me now. Varieties, uh, you know, uh, the other thing to think about is do you, do you want to do hybrid? Do you want to do heirloom? What is the difference even? Heirloom is a stabilized variety that can be open pollinated. That means that they self pollinate tomatoes. So you can collect the seed from that tomato and most likely it will be that tomato. Okay. Um, 
with hybrids, they come from two different variety parents and are bred together so that that first generation has very specific qualities that they're looking for in a hybrid. So it might have like production and disease resistance, that kind of thing. But when you save the seeds, you're not gonna get that same thing. You're gonna get the scattering out of the genetics from that. So you'll have like 25% this, 25% that, and 50% that, right? I like heirloom varieties a lot. I haven't really experimented too much with uh, hybrids and that kind of thing to increase production, but I love the heirlooms that I grow. So like, I feel like if I didn't grow them every year, if I grew something completely different, I, th I feel like I would miss it. It would also be a big investment to buy those seeds and then have to buy them every year again because I couldn't save my seeds. So that's part of my decision. All right, on to the next section, germination. One of the first things that you want to consider when you're starting seeds indoors is when you're like, okay, I'm looking at this packet of seed and I want you to ask this question. Can I plant this outdoors? <laughs> Cause there's a lot of stuff that you can seed outdoors. Lettuce is one of them. I have a video on how to winter sow lettuce. I will link that down below. When you grow lettuce, lettuce goes to seed by itself. So if you let it go to seed and those seeds scatter, uh, you're gonna get them coming up all over your garden as volunteers in the spring and that happens a lot in my garden and it's an awesome thing so sometimes I kind of scatter the seed so I can get an early crop of lettuce without doing any work so think a little bit about that is this a cold hardy crop can it be seeded outside if so when uh, you can refer to like some of the what goes outside when and what to sow in March to see what can be sown out very early and I will link that video down below as well. And all of my videos can be found on the Berry Edge Recording playlist on my channel. So, can it go outside and how long will it be inside? That's the other thing. I highly encourage you to develop a gardening calendar and I will be making a video about how to make your gardening calendar. And you can go to any dollar store and pick up a calendar in the stationery section for very, very cheap. You use that as your, your planting calendar so you can write all over it whatever you have to write about your garden stuff. And there's stuff to do all year round, so trust me, you can be writing all over that thing. You want to consider your, your start date and your planting can, calendar um, as to when you have to start seeds indoors, depending on what you want to do. Onions start very, very early as indoor. Another one that starts very early indoor is uh, artichoke and cardoon. How long they're going to be inside your house and how big they're going to get, because if you have to keep up potting stuff, you have to think about how much room it's going to take. All of these were, were in these little cups before. So I only transplanted out like four of each of these into the cups and as you see I now have like shelves <laughs> full. If you started too many seeds either pull some or give some away because when they start getting bigger it's gonna seem a little daunting so keep in mind how much room you have in your garden plan out what you're gonna put out where <laughs> so you don't sort of like overestimate how much space you have and say, let's say, oh, I wanna grow 60 different types of tomatoes, and then you realize you only have a four by four garden, you can't really do that. So, keep all of these things in mind, because it, you know, the enthusiasm can really overtake you. It's, it can be such a cool, fun thing to dream about and think about this potential that you have in starting this amazing garden uh, that will like be this bounty of produce for you, this cornucopia. Uh, but you have to be smart about how you plan it out so that it doesn't overwhelm you and get too daunting so that it doesn't work, you know? We want to be successful. Heat mat. A lot of seeds need heat in order to germinate properly. This does not mean like a heating pad that you put on your back or your belly, okay? Uh, Seedling mats are sold in garden centers. You can get them, I think, at Walmart or any garden place. They usually cost around 10, 10 to fifteen dollars, I think. Generally cheap. You can get them on Amazon, whatever. They're at a you know particular temperature. I think some models you can select the temperature, but stuff like these eggplant seeds over here that are germinating right now. These in here, the reason why they are here is because it's sandwiched between the two lights, so it's getting heat from above and heat from below. So this is a warm spot. That's why I don't have a uh, seedling mat, but 
a seedling mat is, I think, very, very well, well worth it. I've seen trials done on germination tests without the seedling mat and with the seedling mat, and germination is completely, like, different. So I would, I would suggest using seedling mat uh, for um, seeds that need a warm temperature to germinate. Now, on a seed, on a seed packet, you're going to have all of this information. So this one. Uh, on the side, you see there is all kinds of little information printed there, and it's stuff like it's how long it takes to sprout the ideal temperature. And here, this one, it says between 50 and 75. And then the seed depth that you have to plant it in, plant spacing, whether it's frost hardy, and the minimum full sun hours that it needs. This is something that needs cooler temperatures with a lot of sun. So it's a little, a little bit more challenging than some of the typical stuff that you would grow indoors in a setup like this. Seed starting soil, but how much moisture should there be? Now, squeeze test for your soil. You want to pre-moisten your soil. This is very important because a lot of times when you get the soil from the store, it is bone dry. And it can be a little bit hydrophobic. That means it can repel the water instead of holding it. Moisten it up and make sure that that water is really absorbed. Now, when you pick up a clump of soil, you should be able to squeeze it. And it should be moist, but not have water running from your hands when you squeeze it. Because if it's too wet, it's going to rot your seeds. The other thing that you want to do is label the variety and the date of what you're putting in there because seedlings look very similar. And especially when you're new, a lot of the stuff looks all the same. Brassicas it looks exactly the same. And if you can write the start date that you started those seeds, you'll also know, you know, the length of how long it's been. Uh, growing for, which is important to when your fruiting starts. Next, moisture and domes. When you are starting those seedlings uh, to keep the moisture in, in the soil, uh, a dome can be very helpful. If you're not using a dome, the seedlings can dry out very easily. If you're using a dome, you don't really have to add water or mist it that often. Uh, it will retain the moisture. You can touch the surface of the soil and feel for it. And you'll be able to tell that you don't need to add any more <laughs> water. Don't overdo it with the water, okay? That is a rookie mistake that we've all done. If you had your seedlings growing and all of a sudden they, they look like this and then they went like... That was most likely, well, because you watered them too much. I've done it before. We've all done it. But let's not water too much. Let's use a humidity dome in order to keep the humidity in there and to keep a nice, proper environment for starting your seeds. How close together and pricking out. So this is another thing. Now, there are different ways that you can start seeds. If you do it in a four cell, this is a four cell. Plant one seed or two seed in each cell and then you'll trim the one that is less vigorous, right? So you have the best one out of two. The reason why you put two instead of one is because you'll always get 100% germination. By putting two seeds in there, you're not wasting any soil, you're not wasting the soil, you're not wasting the space on the shelf, and you're not wasting the water and the light, etc. You get the drill. <laughs> that pretty much covers it for germination. Let's go to soil mixes. Now, when I was first a gardener, I didn't really care about soil too much. It's only starting to be about now that I'm really starting to care about the soil because I haven't really amended my beds in a while. They're not producing as much. So the reason why is because all of that wonderful, lovely organic matter that was in the bed when I filled it with triple soil when I first put the beds in has been used up in the past years gardening. All of the plants that grew from there were using that organic matter. And so now I have to put organic matter back in there and feed the soil so the soil can feed the plants and the plants can feed me. Uh, what is the difference between the different soils? So there's starting mix, there's potting mix, there's garden soil. I mean, you go to the store now and there is just like a load of different stuff and it can be very overwhelming. Starting mix. Uh, should retain a lot of moisture. It doesn't need nutrients in it because everything is in the seed until you transplant it when it's got the true leaves on it. Potting mix is going to have a little bit more organic matter uh, to feed your seedling. The energy that was in the seed that's packed with it, you can sort of think of it as the yolk for the chicken that's in the egg, right? 
um, that's been used up and so you have to amend it so there's more nutrients in that type of soil and as well the makeup of the soil is a little bit different to encourage the growth for the roots. And then there is garden soils. Uh, depending on where you live, there might not be a defined definition for what garden soil has to be, along with compost, along with black earth, you know. So it might be worth looking into what these things are, doing a little bit of research, say, okay, what's in this and what would be good. Generally speaking, you want to have a mix of uh, compost that is rich in nutrients for the plants, something like peat moss that is sort of like the carbon that is gonna be that sort of bulk in the soil. If you're filling your beds, you're gonna have like some topsoil. In my mix that I've been doing, uh, I've been doing black earth, uh, shrimp compost, and peat moss. If you're part of the group on Facebook, let's start a thread about that if you want. If you're like, how, what, am, what kind of soil am I gonna do? I wanna make sure I wanna fill my beds nice. Does this look like a good soil? Let's, let's see. So pop on over to Facebook and you can look up the Carrie's Berry at your gardening. The life of a seedling also, when it comes to the soil, what is it going to need and when? You are just starting out, like I said, it doesn't need all the nutrients. Then you're cycling into needing a little bit more, you know, a place to grow. It's like you're having kids, right? You know? And then finally, when you put it in the garden, you can deal with having something a little bit more hardy, but you want to... Uh, give it a good start and so you send it off to college with you know a little bit of extra stuff So you want to plant some extra amendments in the hole like when you're planting tomatoes out And there's a lot of ways that people do this some people plant fish heads some people put an egg in some people put bananas in like I don't know. There's you can look up all these different things on the web about like the the different things that people put into the hole when they're planting things out in the garden and it's really kind of interesting. So fertilizer in soil mixes. That can also be an issue if a fertilizer uh, that you're using if you're using a non-organic fertilizer or a chemical fertilizer that can cause some issues. Okay. This is organic. I'm going to talk to you about all the weird stuff that's in this. Where's the ingredients? Because you're going to love this. All right. Feather meal, alfalfa meal, bone meal, blood meal, glacial rock dust, natural rock phosphate, fish bone meal, mineralized phosphate, potassium sulfate, insect frost, that, that's insect poo, <laughs> uh, basalt rock dust, humic acid, gypsum, kelp meal, oyster shell flour, and green sand. Green sand is a very expensive ingredient that people use to amend their gardens with. I invested in this because what I had had previously that I bought my first year of gardening when I was experimenting with hydroponic uh, lettuce production in my apartment in Toronto. And I was also like doing some eggplants and stuff like that. So um, I got hydroponic nutrients. That was really working out and I was noticing some problems. Something as simple as the nutrients in the medium that you're growing could be the difference between like success or failure with these things. I know it feels complicated. Don't, don't, don't be, don't be intimidated. Don't be intimidated. It's just dirt, right? It's just dirt. It's just dirt. But you wanted to make it a nice place for the soil to live because an organic garden thrives when the soil is healthy and can support a multitude of life. Not just your plants, but also insects, worm, fungi, all kinds of stuff. And trust me, that's how you get a really, really good ecosystem for your garden. All right, let's get back to our seedlings. Life inside. Light. Water. Air. You're definitely going to want, you know, uh, a sunny spot to do things or, you know, get a light. Let's talk about lights for newbies for a little bit because I have seen a lot of people buy stuff off of Amazon um, that have been on sort of special this season, kind of maybe highlighted products. And there is a light that's got sort of four arms and each arm's got a skinny little LED track on it. From what I have seen, this is not a lot, enough light for like pretty much anything. Maybe a house plant, but a house plant doesn't really require a light. My friends who've been using those, typically I'm seeing very leggy seedlings, which means that they're trying to come up towards the light, not the light. So you want, if you're using those, get it as close to the seedlings as you possibly can without touching them. Honestly, a shop light that's, that's cheap, that's cheaper than one of those, it's really, you just plug it in it goes. I have mine on a timer. You can get a, a timer, very inexpensive, from any hardware store. So that's my setup. And when it's not my regular growing season, in the winter, I can use this for all kinds of stuff. I can use a shelf just like normal shelf, 
but I can also grow microgreens or anything else that I want in the winter. water. Um, don't overwater your seedlings. What was that? Don't overwater your seedlings, please. A lot of things like to dry out first before, but not dry them too much. The, see, this is why I don't like those little peep things because it's very hard to regulate the moisture on those things. Bottom water. Um, when it comes to these ones, I put it in like a bucket and put water in the bottom of a bucket and put the plants in right, right? Uh, with this one, if it's got like that and no holes in the bottom, you can pour the water in here. All of these have holes in the bottom. So, right? And what does that do? That encourages the roots in the plant to seek the water from the bottom and grow down and develop the root system. If you're just doing shallow watering from the top, it's going to develop a short shallow root system in the top and not really a lot down at the bottom and you want to encourage the growth down to the bottom and you can just stick your finger straight in the soil and feel and if it feels like it's still like moisture there you could wait oh and if it's too dry trust me you, you, they'll let you know too nutrients natural versus chemical you know like i said i learned my my lesson with some chemical nutrients and so now i'm going for the milder the better and not every time if you have to pot up uh, let's let's just go over that first. Potting up. If you have to pot up, uh, why and when? So if you've got roots coming out of the bottom, then it's time to pot it up because you don't want the plant to become root bound because then it will have trouble when you put it out. Really like the red solo cups that I just get them from Costco and I drill the holes in the bottom. Uh, and lately I've been using a mycorrhizal amendment. People are like, what is that? Mycorrhiza is a type of fungus that helps the growth of roots of a plant. It's a symbiotic relationship is a beautiful thing. Fungi and plant roots uh, go together like humans and gut microbiota. That's a whole other discussion. Doing that to encourage uh, root growth and less shock when I transplant the, the plants. And I'll do that when I plant it out into the garden as well. And that's something actually new that I'm doing this year that I haven't really done before. Every year I try to improve things. If I can give you the advice now and you could use it now. Why not? Then finally, finally, we finally get to the good part. Getting it outside, right? Right? Planting it out. Everybody is so eager. By the way, it's fake spring right now. In a lot of places, it's fake spring. There will be another frost. You know, the next two weeks, I see no uh, frosty weather. Can I plant my stuff? No. No. I see, like, in the first couple weeks of May, there is a dip down. Don't trust the weather report, right? If it says it's going to be five degrees, it could be, like, zero. And you're going to have a hard frost and, like, boom, your plants are done. When it is the right time to plant them out. This is what you do. The weather is great. Let's say it's middle of May. Frost is, uh, risk of frost is over. It's time to plant my plants out. What do I do next? You must harden off your plants. What is hardening off? Hardening off a plant is getting it used to outside sun. Now, outside sun is not the same as inside fake sun. Inside fake sun is like Teletubby sun. It's not real. Outside sun has strong UV rays and the, your little baby plants need to fortify themselves so they don't get a sunburn and die. This is how you do it. You take your seedlings, you take them outside for a half an hour the first day, you put a timer on and you don't forget it, okay? These are your babies outside. <laughs> half an hour the first day and then you bring them back inside. The day after that, you can do an hour. The day after that, you want to do an hour and a half. The day after that, two hours. And then from there, you can go up by an hour. Three hours, four hours. By the time they're out for four hours a day, they are safe to plant. But it takes like a week to harden them off. Do not skip this step. Put a schedule for that so that you remember. There are things that can tolerate a little bit of frost. Okay? Brassicas are one of them. Things that can tolerate a little bit of cooler temperatures like tomatoes, you know, an overnight low of six or eight degrees Celsius. Nothing cooler than that. That is enough for them to be able to survive. There are things that really hate the cold. Peppers hate the cold, eggplants hate the cold, and okra hate the cold. Those are, that's my experience. And so those things I don't put out until like the overnight lows are warmer. And then when you're planting out, as I've covered this before, 
you want to maybe add a little bit of amendments, you know, if you want to add that little egg on the bottom of your tomato, you can do it now. You can add that mycorrhizal amendment in order to encourage the root growth. And you can get those from garden supply stores, home grow stores. They have a lot of interesting products, so you never know where gardening could take you. Once you plant it in, and depending on what you're planting, some things you can plant deep. A tomato you can plant in deep, other things you can't. So make sure you look into that before you just take, you know, like a, an okra plant and plant it like up to the very top of where the, the growth is starting. Peppers are another thing that you can't really bury the stem. Uh, because that can cause stem rot and that can kill your plant. And then you want to water it in. So uh, to encourage the roots and the soil that you've planted in to kind of settle in there and give it a good start, you want to give it a good soak to water it in. And then next thing you know, you're growing a garden. Hey! All right, guys, that is going to be it. That was a lot. Did you guys stay through the whole thing? If you did, give me a like down below. That was a lot of information in there. All right, guys, have a great week. Oh, I'm excited to hear who's starting to like, you know, be able to see things in their garden and what their weather is like where they are. Anyhow, guys, have a great week. I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Let's not talk about why I'm redoing the eggplant. <laughs>